Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is our last um, event, our last panel of the symposium. Um, and there's a couple pieces before we get to the panel discussion. Um, and to start off with uh, the first of them, leading up to our discussion about abolition and organizing then and now. Um, I teach in the history and literature program um, in Harvard College um, and get to work with many wonderful students. Um, and a few of those students are going to very briefly um, let you know about a project that they're working on um, in connection with uh, today's event. So come on up. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Enrique Sanchez. I'm a senior here at Harvard. And my name is Juliette Lowe Fleury, and I'm also a senior here at the college. So we are both um, in Thomas's class this semester, and the project that we're working on is building um, an online digital archive um, of various um, reports, correspondence, all sorts of documents related to the Walpole Prison Takeover. Uh, these materials were first uh, preserved by Phyllis Ryan and Reverend Ed Rodman. Um, and they were used by Jamie Bissonette when she wrote her book uh, 20 years ago. So what we're aiming to do is to build a robust online archive so anyone can go ahead um, and access those materials um, on the internet. Yeah, so alongside digitizing all of the files that we've received from um, Reverend Rodman and Phyllis Ryan, we will also be conducting oral interviews with uh, members of the different groups that were present and just so we have that more eyewitness record that can supplement the documents that we already have, and so we'll be tagging those so that they can be used for research. Um, there are only so many people who can come into the Harvard Library to view documents that are here, so we wanna make sure that they're accessible for anyone who wishes to use them and see them. Um, and we hope to have that up and running by the end of the summer, um, and it'll be a good closeout for the 50th anniversary, we think. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will right, we'll try that one more time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Perfect. Um, well, not perfect, but it's better than last time. So um, uh, my name is Toussaint Lossier. Uh, I'm an associate professor uh, in the W.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at UMass Amherst, and i um, very honored uh, to be here. Um, uh, we're, um, all of us in the room, uh, are fortunate in that part of what we're going to be um, participating in uh, shortly is a roundtable discussion around the question of abolition and organizing then and now. And um, we have a very esteemed um, set of panelists to present. Uh, but before we do that, um, part of what we're gonna do is hear um, a recorded presentation from some folks who are not able to join us in the room today. And specifically, we reached out to um, uh, an organization um, in MCI Norfolk that is a legacy organization of some of the groups uh, that you heard from uh, earlier uh, today, particularly groups like uh, Bantu, uh, Black African Nations Together for Unity, and uh, Towards Unity, I'm sorry. And um, uh, part of what the African American Coalition Committee is involved in doing is really trying to um, build on the legacy of organizing and political education that um, Bantu helped to uh, establish an important foundation for. Um, and in particular, as you can see from the program, uh, we're gonna hear a statement from um, Al Amin, uh, or otherwise known as Corey Patterson, who's the vice chair of the AACC, as well as Deshaun Duke uh, Taylor Guinness. Um, who is um, the, who's on the Defense Department of the AACC. So uh, this is an audio recording, and if you could please um, just give it your attention for the duration. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Corey Patterson, but I'm known uh, by all my brothers um, and sisters as Alameen. Um, I'm currently the chair of the African American Coalition Committee, which is here at MCI Norfolk. 
AECC um, began in 1972 as the Black Rights Committee. Um, and originally, uh, you know, the focus was more so on protecting the state and constitutional rights of black incarcerated men within the prison. Um, there's a lot of history with the AECC. Um, and I know, un you know, but unfortunately by the time that I got to, um, the Norfolk prison, which was 2013, um, the AECC was kind of at like a historic low. Um, and so much so that I never really even heard anything about the AECC, um, nor went to any of its events um, until about three years after I got to the compound. Um, and around 2016, um, I myself, you know, being a black man, obviously, um, but also being a, a Muslim, um, was dealing with a few of my own personal ordeals and struggles in the prison, um, being put in solitary confinement and under investigation, you know, for about, for about, um, I remember sitting in a hole listening to the country elect, you know, an openly, uh, Islamophobic racist president, um, and I also, the, the following year, um, my mother had passed away, um, 50 years, 56 years young. Um, so all around this time, these things was happening before I started, um, gravitated towards the AACC. Um, I had a lot of anger in me. And, you know, I just needed somewhere to channel that anger. If not, you know, it probably would have been you know, channeled in something uh, much more negative. Um, but it was around this time that, you know, that it was about 30 black and brown men. We came together um, and we essentially resurrected the AEC, AECC. Um, the chairman at the time, he ended up getting, uh, you know, lugged off the compound. You know, um so there was no chairman, so, you know, we stepped in. Um, and, and when we stepped in, like, we, you know, we wrote the, rewrote the bylaws, we, we formed nine departments um, that became, like, the pulse um, and, you know, the, the, the central, the centralized departments was pretty much the, the, the pulse of the AECC. I see the AECC, like, really as... It's really no. It's it's basically black culture in its essence, right? And like black culture, you know, you know, we seek to always collectively and survive and prosper, um, even if we have to evolve, transform, or adapt. Um, and we do so, you know, in a environment, you know, that's you know entrenched with white supremacy, which deploys many different forms of racism, uh, which continues to suppress and oppress, you know, black people. Um, but it was in 2019 that, you know, we came together and we decided um, to file some legislation. Um, we had worked with a we was working at, by this time, we was working with a state rep by the name of Russell Holmes. And Russell Holmes, uh, he believed in us after he met with us. Um, he's seen how organized we were and how serious we were about trying to change our condition. One of the things that we've been pushing for a while now was a civil rights complaint um, to really uh, against the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office due to the 1960. Uh, five Civil Rights Act, um, black people are protected class, and that means that there's an extra level of scrutiny um, when it comes to um, any governmental contact with, we've noticed, and like the whole, you know, state and country have noticed that black people have had a disproportionate contact with 
criminal legal system, and that's, there's no different in Suffolk County. So this is a civil rights issue. We see it as a civil rights issue. So we you know, have been pushing for the Attorney General um, to open up a civil rights investigation against the Suffolk County um, District Attorney's Office. This past legislative um, session, we 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 you know we filed a, a bill to, to eradicate the joint venture theory. What this joint venture theory is is that if you may not have if you was with somebody that committed a crime like murder, just by you simply going there and being a part of that, even if you didn't commit the crime, that you can be given the same amount of time as a person who committed the murder. So in many cases. For more time, if the person who committed the murder decides to plead guilty, but you go to trial because you know that you're innocent and you didn't do it, um, we've been also pushing to abolish life without parole. Um, um, there's a, some legislation that we're looking to file this session through Russell Holmes, and some of the things that we do on the inside, outside of legislation, is parole prep. Um, we have a conflict resolution team, which deals with uh, some of the, you know, internal strife or rival uh, uh, beefs that, you know, some of our people from our community and our AECC constituency, you know, come, you know, they come into prison because outside in the community they had, you know, gang beef or whatever the case may be. So when they come to the camp sometimes they still bring that, you know, that, that, that beef is still ongoing. So we have a conflict resolution team to help to see if we can actually you know, prevent some of that, uh, you know, be, you know, uh, rivals from, from escalating. Um, we do high set tutoring, um, you know, and, and this is just, again, to go back to, you know, to our belief in, in, you know, epitomizing black culture, um, and, 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 and truly, you know, in this day and age, I believe that, any type of abolitionist work, um, any type of work around trying to combat or reform the criminal legal system has to embody black culture. Um, because, again, black culture is just not about changing something. It's about surviving and prospering. So we can change stuff um, all we want, right? And that change can oftentimes is temporary as we see throughout history, but we have to set ourselves up to survive and, and continue to prosper. Um, and, and this is what has to be infused. This is the truly, I believe, the abolitionist mind state. Mind state. Um, and, I, and I believe that we have to, um, we have to always remember that that has to be our, our North Star um, and our guiding principle. Um, you know, when we when we come across some of the, the younger brothers who come into the institution, it's such a, a beauty um, to see how they come in with a certain mentality. Um, oftentimes, it's still you know, you know, one that's you know, it could be we can categorize as a street mentality or just you know, not necessarily being woke yet to the reality of their situation. Uh, you know, still with you know, a, a, a street mentality, oftentimes, right? This hardened, you know, sh you know, shell um, because of our early childhood experiences, right? So, especially being young black men growing up in, in the city, we taught to solve all our problems. We have to just be tougher. We end up, you know, taking out a lot of our frustration and anger on each other. Um, whether it be through rival gangs or domestic violence or whatever the case uh, may be. But, you know, you have young brothers that have come in and they have, like, literally have murder smoke. Like, I'm talking, like, you know, you know individuals, you know, this person may have, you know, took the life of somebody that was a close friend, you know, or or family member from a rival gang. Um and they come into the institution, and oftentimes, um, you know, that that beef continues. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful sight when you can actually see two individuals that once had, you know, 
this intense rivalry between each other to actually, you know, squash that um, and 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 really see right that the the workings of structural racism, you know, really being the cause of their problems and beef in the first place. Um, we got this thing that we say, we, we say, know your smoke. Um, and know your smoke was something that we kind of came up with, you know, maybe 2018. Um, and it's basically just saying that, you know, our smoke is not each other. Like, you know, that this is a term that we use in the streets when you got beef with each other. But our smoke is not each other. Right? Our smoke is white supremacy. Right? Our smoke is structural racism. Right? Like, individuals know what to do when, you know, someone from a rival neighborhood, you know, may come through and assault someone, shoot somebody. Right? But what do you do when the district attorney, you know, gives your right hand man a life sentence? What do you do? Like, Individuals are not equipped for that, right? So when we talk about Know Your Smoke, it's about educating individuals to deal with structural racism and really to kind of channel that a lot of that misplaced anger and rage from each other to systems that created that anger and rage in those, communi- those you know, communities of isolated poverty in the first place. Um, and the brother Duke, like one of our youngest members, there's a brother, his name is Duke, one of the youngest members of our organization who you'll hear from, um, who I got a chance to see him, you know, he's from Boston, I got a chance to see him in our auditorium at one of our general membership meetings, I actually squashed that beef. And now, you know, you know, he's leading in our, 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 our defense department right now in the AECC. Um, and it's just a beautiful sight. You know, um, and I and and you know, this is these are the types of things that I want the AECC to be known for um, and to be remembered for. Hey, my name's um, Sean Taylor Jennings. Um, a lot of my friends and family, you know, they call me Duke. And, you know, um, I'm here to speak on, you know, basically my experience with the AECC. Um, which is, for those who don't know, the African American Coalition Committee. Um, Alameen um, presented me with, uh, you know, this opportunity to speak on, you know, just my experience and, you know, everything that I've, you know, like seen and, you know, gone through with the um, group and the program. And it's definitely different, you know, because I came to MCI Norfolk, you know, to, you know, better myself and help me do programs. You know, and, and stuff like that, you know, so I can, you know, just work on myself and, you know, elevate and get ready for my freedom and whatnot. And it was definitely a different experience. Like, my role, there's different, there's nine different departments in the AACC, and the department I'm a part of right now is um, the Defense Department. And basically what the Defense Department does is, you know, we ensure, like, the smooth running of, like, meetings and events and, you know, when guests come, like, you know, we escort them to where they got to go and, you know, we we make sure everyone gets their questions in and we just, you know, keep the, try to keep the peace and the order, you know, with, within uh, within our meetings and, you know, in our events and stuff like that. And through the Defense Department, I'm also, you know, in, well, it's basically a collaboration between the Defense Department and um, community engagement which is um, CRT, and the CRT is a conflict resolution team, so, you know, I'm fairly new to that, so I'm still getting, you know, you know, put on to, you know, what things we're working on and what's going on there, but a brief, you know, summary of what that is, is the CRT, conflict resolution team, that's basically like, you know, a lot of times there's people from different demographics and different backgrounds, you know, who, who often you know, probably could be rival gang members or, you know, people who got issues and stuff like that. And when they come down to the camp, you know, we can't stop everything, you know. We're not the police, you know, we're not the COs, but we're we're closer to the to the trauma and the violence than they are and we understand better. So what we do is like, you know, if someone who has issues comes down here, you know, we try to mediate it to the best of our abilities, you know. We can give a uh, 
Uh, appreciate the round of applause for um, the contribution from Alameen and from Duke. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm now going to pass it to uh, Tone, the organizer, to help us um, introduce our panel. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to say peace be upon you. My name is Tone, and I am an organizer. I am a Malcolmite, which means I study and practice the teachings of uh, Minister Brother Malcolm X, and I'm an abolitionist. Um, thank you so much for being here. It is very important that um, we are addressing this and uplifting it, so it is my honor to uh, co-facilitate with my brother Toussaint. Um, we also have the pleasure to introduce um, some members of the panel, so I will begin by reading um, some bios. <laughs> First is uh, Margaret Burnham. Um, she is a university distinguished professor of law at Northeastern University. She's the faculty co-director of the Law School's Center for Law, Equity, and Race, otherwise known as CLEAR, and founded and directs the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, CRRJ. Professor Burnham began her career at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, and in 1970s uh, represented civil rights and political activists. In 1977, she became the first African-American woman to serve in the Massachusetts judiciary, where she joined the Boston Municipal Court bench as an associate justice. In 1993, South African President Nelson Mandela appointed Professor Burnham to serve on an international human rights commission to investigate alleged human rights violation within African National Congress. Please uh, give uh, Professor Brandon a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. I will further introduce uh, the Reverend Ed Rodham. Uh, uh, Reverend Rodham is a retired Episcopal, Episcopal excuse me, priest. He's the former professor of pastoral theology, a consultant to the Urban Bishops Coalition, co-founder of the Urban Caucus, and consultant to the Union of Black Episcopalians. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's an honorary doctor of pastoral theology at the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and an honorary doctors of law at St. Augustine University in Riley, North Carolina. He was the leader of the ad hoc committee, the outside organization supporting the NPRA at Walpole. If you had the pleasure of joining us last night, you saw the wonderful documentary. If you haven't seen it, I would suggest that you watch it and rewatch it again, because there's a lot we can learn from those brothers. Thank you. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce uh, Kazi Torre, um, uh, who's to my left here. Um, Kazi is a man who believes in his convictions and has been convicted for his beliefs conned by the Constitution and beat up and harassed by the police. He's a former political prisoner who was arrested and convicted in 1982 for seditious conspiracy. Since coming home, he has taught at Massachusetts Bay Community College and Roxbury Community College. He worked at the American Friends Service Committee and was a delegate to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. He is co-chair of the Jericho Movement, which works for uh, amnesty for political prisoners in the United States. Um, please join me in welcoming Kazi to the panel. And last, but certainly not least, is Andrea James, uh, who is an abolitionist community organizer. She is the founder and executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, founder for Families for Justice is Healing, and author of Upper Bunkies Unite, and other thoughts on the politics of mass incarceration. As a former criminal defense attorney and formerly incarcerated woman, Andrea uses her professional and personal experiences to end the incarceration of women and girls through reimagining our communities and creating infrastructures to facilitate people-led thriving neighborhoods. Uh, please welcome Andrea James to the panel. All right, so we're gonna start with our first question. And um, I wanna preface this question by one saying, peace to the brothers that we heard earlier. Um, they offered a number of insights as to abolition today. And we know after George Floyd, we're living um, in a uh, garrison state. <laughs> We've known this for some time. We see what's going on in Cop City. So I'd like to um, throw this first question to An Andrea and ask, um, 
What does abolition look like today? How does one practice abolition in the current context? That's a huge question. <laughs> uh, I can only speak from our experience. Uh, we were women incarcerated in the federal prison for women in Danbury, Connecticut back in 2010. And we started to organize ourselves. If you remember, 2010 was a time in this country where there was an uptick in the dialogue around the need to end what they referred to then, and some still refer to, as the need to end mass incarceration. And it was mostly because of uh, a book written by Michelle Alexander, although so many people, incarcerated people, formerly incarcerated people, other scholars and researchers had written about this need, something about what and the way that Michelle presented this information really caught the attention of an entire country, the chronology of from slavery to mass incarceration in this country. That was one thing. The other thing that was creating kind of like some ripples while we were women incarcerated in this federal prison with about 2,000 of us in Danbury at the time was a book written by our now comrade. We didn't know her then, but she had come through Danbury before us and they had moved her out to somewhere else. That was Piper Kerman. Now, Piper will tell you, don't you know, don't pay attention to Orange is the New Black, the, the, the movie, <laughs> read my book. And, and Piper's story was a story about a, a more affluent, more privileged white woman who went to prison. And that was important because it caught the attention of a lot of younger white college age women who really started to pay attention to this issue who had never really paid attention to it before. And th both of those books came into the prison while we were incarcerated in 2010. But what we heard on the news and everywhere else, and because of the coverage of these two stories, was a lot of uh, dialogue around the need to pay attention to the criminal law system in this country. What we didn't hear was anything about the 2,000 of us crammed in that women's prison. It's now flip-flop back to a, a small number of women up top, and at the FCI, it's back to men again. But um, back then, it was all women. And we were women who the majority of us were mothers. Um, the majority of us had been separated from our children. Many of the sisters had been there for a, a minimum of a decade. Many mm. of them in our leadership circle now, who we fought to bring home, had already done 20, 25 years, still didn't have an outdate, had no idea when they were going to come home. And so we had inappropriate feminine hygiene products. We had um, bad, bad, bad food. Um, we had very non-existent health care. All of these things that caused us as women to sit up in the prison and say, what about us? And then again, remember, in 2010, you weren't hearing from the brothers either. It was academia. Mm -hmm. It was huge institutes like where we are today and all over the Vanderbilt and all these other places that were carrying the message. And if you had a formerly incarcerated person on your panel, it was so that we could share all the messy parts of our lives mm -hmm. so that some expert could then come behind us and, and say, here's what we're doing about it. Well, we were women sitting in the prison and we wanted our voices to be heard. We had no idea how we were gonna do it. And I just had the privilege, I am not the poster woman for incarceration. My leadership circle has women on that circle who served 42 years, 25 years, 27 years, 32 years, 16 years, 17 years. They didn't know where their children were. Their children were stolen from them by the Adoption Safe Family Act, ushered in by the same Clinton administration that ushered in mandatory minimums in the um, uh, 1994 Crime Act. And so we didn't hear anything about who we were, and we wanted to have our voices heard. And so we started to organize ourselves, which was a challenge within itself. That is against the rules in a prison to organize, um, to even be at a table with more than three of us at a time. And so we used every opportunity we could. My parents were very instrumental in helping to get information to us. My dad was just stealth with how he got uh, information and just copied books. And sometimes books got in, <clears throat> Betty Burke. Uh, uh, was, was on the ground with us, and Kathy Hoffman just spending hundreds of dollars trying to get books into us that they uh, repeatedly sent back because they knew we were organizing and they didn't want us to have access to this information. But we still prevailed. I was the first person to be able to leave, and the message was that I was sent out, and the instructions by Grandma, a matriarch who was 76 and dying at the time, who we uh, needed to get out, 
um, had already served 23 years in the, in the system, in the federal system. The mandate from the sisters who were inside organizing was you go out there, you have privilege, you have access to information, you have access to people, you have access to education institutions, including your law school at Northeastern. You can at least begin to tell our story and try and get people to understand why we shall no longer use jails, cages, and prisons to separate women from their children and to put women and, and girls into. And so I was instructed to do that by the sisters. And we fought under President Obama. We pushed out more than 50 women, um, serving very protracted, some life with no parole in the federal system, and we've been on the ground ever since moving to push our sisters out and create infrastructures for how we end the incarceration unapologetically, unapologetically, because if you know the pressure we were put under um, by other people, other people even in the movement, men in the movement, who stepped to us to say, it's not about, it's not about that. And it is about that. It was Angela Davis who encouraged us and Kathy Boudin who told us, you damn right we need a gender analysis on this issue. And so we have stu stood bravely in that space and unapologetically said, we are going to work and we are going to end the incarceration of women and girls in this country and beyond. And so that's the work we do for us. It's, it's, it's not about whether you understand abolition, it's do you at least have some place to go that are openly uh, 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 describing, carrying the work of abolition, whether you believe it's possible or not, are you doing something to work toward abolition? That's what we need to focus on. And so that's what we've been doing. And we literally mean, I mean, we marched across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We, we are doing stuff, Bobby. And, and a lot of the brothers in the system still will not honor and respect the work that is being led by incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and across this country. We're doing real work. We I moved a jail moratorium bill to the governor's desk in one session. One session, and Baker vetoed it, and we're demanding that Mara Healy, who is the only governor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who has not replaced the DOC and EOPS. Every governor comes in and seats their people. For some reason, this DOC and EOPS with zero transparency in their horrible record, she has refused to create a new thing. So abolition for us is abolition unapologetically with a focus on women and girls. And it is, it is truly abolition. And we can talk about reformist reforms later on, but it's about the abolition, the closing, literally, and shifting resources into community. Mm. Thank, you. Um, thank you very much for that response. And I, I think what the underlying uh, message that we're hearing is that abolition can be a number of different things and it, are, it steps towards a, a, an ideal. And so I'd like to also extend that question to Kazi and ask, what are some um, elements of abolition that people can pick up today so as they can continue to first better understand it and execute abolition um, in the current context? Oh, thank you, Tom. And thank, thank you, you, Andrea, for your words. Um, wow. Well, I think, you know, some of what we've been heard uh, over the last day and a half last night, and we saw the film um, that we understand, if you saw the film, where the prisoners ran Walpole for two, two and a half months, and there was no rapes, no killings, you know, you'll know that we don't need prisons. So if you know that, then what abolition means, we need to shut them down. We need to stop new prison construction, and we need to shut down the prisons that, uh, I mean, I don't have the, the uh, I can't sit up here and give you the answers of what to do afterwards. You know, I mean, we have to all work those things out. But I do know we need to shut those things down now. You know, one day, one day more that somebody else was in there suffering, being beat by guards, 
you know, one more day, women being shackled while they're having babies or whatever. Right. You know, yeah, I mean, it's too, one day too long. You know, people outside, people outside, uh, I, I mean, I worked on a lot of different groups and isolation units and in the death penalty and, you know, people outside though in the organization say, oh, well, we can, we can put that off on the agenda till next week. We can put that off on the agenda. I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about next week? We gotta do this stuff now because people are suffering, dying in there now, today. You know, it's not like, they look at time different out here than inside. You know, so um, I just think that people need to get with, uh, after you get the knowledge and understanding of what this is all about, and what the systems are about, and it's all about white supremacy in the police state, you know, um, then you'll get with other people, you'll start organizing and, and hooking up across the country to shut it down. You know? Thank you, Kazi. Go ahead, Tucson. Sure, I wanted to um, uh, pose a slightly different question to, um, uh, uh, first you, um, uh, Margaret Burnham, and then we'll go to, uh, uh, to Ed Robin. But um, Margaret, I think one of the things that, that stands out um, when we look at this history of the 1973 uh, takeover in Walpole is um, uh, we can't take for granted that it emerged amidst a backlash against um, uh, somewhat progressive, at least reformist administration within the Department of Corrections. Um, and pretty significant prisoner organizing. Um, it stands to reason that an abolitionist movement can't just be built, but it also has to be strategic and creative enough to navigate the inevitable response from those seeking to maintain the status quo. Um, from your perspective, what can activists, organizers, and justice-minded people do to withstand this kind of backlash, some of which we're kind of seeing playing out at this moment in time? Thanks so much, Tucson. And let me just say what a uh, deep honor and pleasure it is to be uh, here learning um, from my sister, uh, Andrea, um, who all praises uh, Andrea, and from Kazi, and certainly from uh, Re uh, Reverend Rod um, up there uh, on the screen. Um, these have all been my heroes, heroes, and teachers for uh, now decades, and so it's a real, a real honor and pleasure to, uh, uh, to be in conversation with them. Um, so, uh, so let me just um, say, first of all, that I think there's a lot to learn, and here I'm echoing what Kazi has just said, um, that uh, our focus today has been, uh, or this, uh, over this past weekend, has been on the Walpole Prison um, takeover. And I'd like to say just a few words about the relationship between the Walpole Prison takeover and abolition, because, of course, we've taken for granted that there is a relationship, but I'd just like to parse that a little bit and think about uh, what, the, what the takeover teaches us about our abolition movement today. Uh, and so, you know, we could say that um, the takeover teaches us, first of all, can we abolish prisons? Uh, how can we abolish prisons? And finally, uh, uh, echoing what uh, Bob Delello and others have said, why, and, and what Kazi just said, why should we abolish prisons? And all of those questions uh, were addressed um, in and were addressed then and are addressed now as we reflect on what happened uh, in the Walpole prison uh, takeover, that this can be done, um, that prisoners, those who are incarcerated, uh, can uh, protect themselves, can govern themselves, uh, uh, that, uh, that, um, that, that, that prisons are uh, inherently, or at least prisons in our context, in the United States of America, are uh, inherently uh, dehumanizing, killing machines, uh, and therefore need to be abolished. And um, as well, those who participated told us not only can we do it, uh, but how to do it. And so learning from the strategies that they applied, the ways in which they reached across race and other lines of difference to come together, the ways in which they uh, articulated their claims and demands um, to the press uh, in a way that was you know, highly sophisticated understanding of public responses and public uh, perceptions about prison. 
questions. Um, so I would say that exemplar one, illustration one, picture one of uh, abolition, what it looks like, what it can look like, uh, would be uh, this Walpole prison um, takeover, which is why uh, we're spending our time uh, on it today. Um, you know, I would also say that, you know, thinking back to um, the point that uh, that uh, Andrea made about you know where where does the where does the abolition uh, frame the abolition movement as we understand it today around prisons and criminal uh, the criminal legal system come from uh, obviously uh, it's been around a long time as Andrea suggests but its uh, current incarnation really starts with the work of my dear sister Angela Davis uh, with the publication of her book. And Angela's coming out, and I think we need to think about uh, where the theorists on abolition are coming from and what that tells us about where we need to go in the future. Um, so Angela obviously is coming out of the perspective that prisons, not, uh, that prisons are the carceral state uh, and prisons in particular are a critical element of our uh, suppression of, um, of, of you know, political activity, political acti activism, uh, the liberation movements in our country have always been targeted uh, by the prisons, and therefore, uh, and therefore, that's that that in and of itself is a reason to think about abolition. Uh, but in addition to that, in our own context here in the United States, you know, prisons are also uh, the manufacturers and the perpetuators of white supremacy. This might not be true in. Norway, but it's true in our situation. It's true in our country, and we have to think about the ways in which, uh, and, and the, if we think, if we if we are anti, if we're anti-racist, um, then we have to think about the ways in which prisons have contributed to, to and amplify white supremacy um, in our country. And Andrea made the link to slavery, and obviously, you know, that's a visual a cognitive link. Uh, I don't think it always works, but, uh, but certainly um, the line between slavery and mass uh, incarceration is also something that in our country, um, in our country uh, makes abolition uh, an imperative. Um, uh, you know, I'll also say, you know, we also, what, what, what Walpole uh, take over taught us is that uh, we need to not just knock down, not just abolish, but we need to build up. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that abolition is not just about abolishing that thing which is transgressing justice, but it's also about building new forms and new, new, new forms and new containers uh, and new relationships around the question of justice. And that's why the work that, And that uh, Andrea uh, and, and my brother Kazi have done is just um, so, so important. Now let me just also say on the question of abolition um, that um, while, uh, while it is obviously uh, t gone, uh, uh, the, the, the campaign, the call for the claim for abolition um, has, you know, just ex ex expanded exponentially uh, in, certainly in uh, progressive communities, but really all across this country, way beyond what, and this, I'm taking this from a what Angela herself has told me, way beyond what the original articulators of this um, position ever thought it would. Uh, but you know, while that's also true, I also think we need to think very carefully about this notion that there are that there is a rigid, strict, and easily identifiable line between so-called reformist, reformist reforms mm -hmm. and uh, uh, revolutionary or abolitionist reforms. Mm -hmm. I don't think that line is as clear as people want it to make. And I think the more we realize uh, how uh, fragile or how uh, easily manipulable that line is, the better off we all are. Mm -hmm. So let me just ask you, for uh, furloughs in the 1970s, is that reformist reform or is it abolitionist reform? Education at Boston University, reformist or, uh, uh, or abolitionist? Higher pay for guards, reformist or abolitionist? Better training for guards? Reformist or abolitionist? Now we can argue all this, and we should argue and debate it, and we should think about uh, what, what we want to support and what we don't. But this is not a question of this one egg basket, the one basket of eggs over here and another over here, and if you're not in my basket, well, you're not an abolitionist. It's that I don't think it's really, I don't think it's that simple, I don't think it's that straightforward. Leadership like John Boone, getting him from Atlanta to come up to 
Boston to lead the prison system here? Reformists or abolitionists? Think about that, folks. Um, so what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. I'll come back on that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I want to pose a question to um, our dear brother, uh, Reverend Ed Rodman. Um, and um, specifically want to, uh, we're, we're very fortunate in that um, uh, the program that was put together for this event actually has a couple quotations from you that are included in uh, Jamie Bissonnette's uh, When the Prisoners Ran Walpole. And, uh, and one of the quotations that folks can see on their program, um, you talk about the, uh, the work that you did in terms of helping the organizer, or, sorry, organize the Ad Hoc Committee uh, for Prison Reform's um, Observer Program. And this real fantastic uh, effort will leave open the question of whether it is a reformist reform or an abolitionist reform um, that was documented um, in the film that we saw last night where you had civilians uh, inside the prison um, and actively involved in terms of um, uh, uh, documenting what was taking place uh, behind bars. Um, and in uh, Bissonnette's book, you're quoted as saying that many of the civilian observers um, uh, were struck with the temptation to fix prisons and uh, as a result of kind of getting struck on that temptation had a hard time appreciating NPRA as an abolitionist project. Um, and it sounds like here what you're talking about is, to some degree, uh, the problem of a liberal preference for reform over abolition, sort of what we were just kind of going mm. back and forth on. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the ways that the ad hoc committee tried and failed to build public opposition to prisons during the course of the Walpole takeover? And what lessons do these failures hold for us today? Deep question. Very deep. I don't know that there are any lessons beyond getting involved and understanding how the system works, being supportive of the true reformers and the people who are committed to change, and then listening to them and following through without interjecting your own thoughts idea. That's not easy, certainly not easy for liberals, but for people who are committed to genuine change, it's the beginning and ending point. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So um, Angela Davis has been mentioned a number of times. Um, and in her milieu, she uh, mentions, uh, or she ex kind of gives a contemporary uh, expression of Du Bois's abolitionist democracy. In the film, again, I'm encouraging folks to uh, watch it, <laughs> um, we hear from one of the teachers um, on the inside who describes that, um, you know, uh, someone is being paid $80,000. And he didn't even say he should get that money. He said it should be poured back into the school. He was thinking about others. Um, and so the question for, um, I'm gonna leave it to anyone in the panel who wants to answer, is how do we think about political education in a way that reproduces that level of thinking, that Ubuntu, which is the I am, therefore you are. Um, the way that people kind of embrace one another and, and learn that like, hey, uh, we are being pit against one another. It is unity that we need to embrace. It is education. What type of political education reproduces that for society, both those who are on the inside and out? Well, I'll just say, uh, you know, um, we're in the uh, kind of, uh, once a year we do a fellowship uh, for formerly incarcerated sisters who are on the ground organizing. And we created that fellowship. It's called the Free Her Fellowship. First of all, I just want to back up a minute because I, I just want to say I am just honored to be here with um, Kazi and Professor Burnham. I went to Northeastern University Law School. Uh, Professor Burnham, the work that she has been doing under um, all of this, under all of this, um, to get to and expose white supremacy, racism, the murdering of black people in this country, um, the need for accountability for that, 
abolition doesn't talk about you not being held accountable. Abolition is about accountability. It's about an individual accountability and it's about the community accountability. So I, I just want to say that because it is a deep honor to be on this panel with Professor Burnham um, and all of the work um, and the example she was to us, not only as law students, but my entire life I've, I've known uh, Professor Burnham through my family and I just want to say thank you. Um, because it's, what we're talking about is the work and what she has been telling us and what Angela has been telling us and Ruthie Wilson Gilmore has been teaching us about the need to be educated. So when we came out on the shoulders of Cherise Shoemate, on the shoulders of Sophia Bukhari, on the shoulders of Cheryl Wilkins and uh, Kathy Boudin and all of these other sisters, Angela and all of these other sisters that had organized inside of a prison. When we came out, we came out swinging you know, like, like, hey, like we have an urgency here. And what we worked really hard to do over the past 12 years is to create this platform for our voices to be heard. But we are the first to say that if you are a formerly incarcerated person and you are using your voice to tell your personal story, which we need, not in a messy kind of way that we've been used to tell our stories, but to share your personal experience to raise awareness in the general public about what this experience is like and the, all the, the, the disruption, economic disruption, familial disruption, fiscal disruption that it causes in our communities uh, and generationally. Great. Come on out. To speak your piece. Have your platform, and we at the National Council and at EFJA have built solid platforms to do that, and we support that. But if you decide that you're going to step out of that space into a policy space, you damn well better know the historical context. You better understand the politics that we're in. You better understand there's a difference between individualism and movement work. And if you don't understand that, you're causing a lot of harm. You're setting us back. And we saw that. We saw the Trump administration use black, formerly incarcerated women and men, still using them. We saw the First Step Act, which was crammed down the throats of the public as we were the only organization to stand the ground in, against that. Why? 75% of the bill leaves out Rather, the bill left out 75% of our black people that we were fighting for, women who were serving life with no parole for a drug sentence that had no relief. And then they spun a narrative that, oh, everybody coming out of the federal system after the First Step Act, there's lots of other problems. But we've done a five-year study. This is the fifth anniversary of the passage of that bill. And the implementation is horrible. So, if you don't understand how important what we call study struggle is, then you're, 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 you're a disservice to this movement. You're causing harm to the real work that's being done to really raise public awareness, really shift public opinion so that we can begin to make significant change. So that's what I would say about the importance of education. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Oh, I would um... Yeah, no, I, I just, I agree with everything you're just saying. And I think that, taking an example, because someone asked earlier today, you know, about like how we did certain things, you know, and people, you know, because if you're growing up in this society, it has to be broken down and undone at some point, you know. You're going through it every day since since grade school, being indoctrinated in it. So you you know you have to undo that uh, first. And so you know what we had to do was uh, we had to learn and recite like combat liberalism, what Mao wrote. We had to you know um, everybody had to learn it. Everybody had to memorize it and put it in their practice, in their walk. We had to read three newspapers every day. We had, you know, different newspapers. We had to had study groups, mm -hmm. you know, where we bounced things off each other, where everybody, like uh, Jabir said earlier, um, uh, no, Shorty, Shorty said earlier, where everybody learned, read the same books mm -hmm. and got to talk about those 
what was in them, you know. Ozzy, what book are you reading now? <laughs> oh, uh, the black, uh, black, black experience in the empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back against yeah. the empire. Back against the empire. Just got it. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, those things uh, we had to do, and I think you know because most of the prisoners are not really politicized, right. you know. So. It, you know, we have to have that study going on, and it has to be, you know, concentrated. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, people develop the programs and things that we need. Uh, you look around, see what people need in the community and develop programs that fit those needs mm -hmm. and whatnot, and uh, continue to build. I would just say that, you know, these conversations uh, go both ways. Um, you know, there's deep uh, politi political education, political literacy going on and has been going on for years in prison and much that's coming out of the prison experiences obviously is ed educative for those of us who are on the other side. Tazi mentioned earlier George Jackson, mm -hmm. Malcolm X's work, um, you know, all of this work, uh, Jean Genet, Angela's work, all this coming out of prisons um, is, you, you know, is part of our own political literacy, working with that material uh, and, 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 and using it and, and, and circulating it. Um, so this is a two-way street. It's not just we're, we're here on the outside, we're here to teach you. It's much more so what everything you've got in there this is something we need to know as well. Uh, and I mean this in a very concrete way, so that uh, folks who are exposed to uh, learning in prison that might not otherwise be available to them. And if you think about Bantu, right, those brothers who were part of Bantu, um, when their relatives are coming up to visit them, they're asking those kids, have you read Book X? Have mm -hmm. you read George Jackson? Have you read, well, you know, France Fanon? Do you know about this? Do you know about that? So th th there's this, you know, there's the ebb and flow back and forth that's going on. And I just want to say one other thing about po political literacy. If you, you know, we're all focused on the ban of critical uh, race, um, what, do you call, what do you call it? The, Thank you. Critical race theory. Uh, and we're looking at Florida, right? And we're fighting as we have fought forever to keep our minds uh, open and keep our minds sharp and, 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 keep, and keep the flow of information moving from space to space, from classroom to classroom. And if we think that what's going down in Florida is not going to interfere with our efforts to keep the schoolhouse doors open inside prisons, we have to think again. Mm -hmm. Because that too, that too has got to be right. part of the struggle uh, to uh, own our classrooms and to, own, and to own our libraries. And here, again, I just wanna, I'm sorry, I keep pointing to Calvin uh, Ari. I'm just so proud of my friendship with, my new friendship with Calvin Ari, who spent so many years in prison in Virginia and now spends most of his time sending books to, all across the Virginia prison system. Mm -hmm. You know, all across the Virginia prison system. And so each of us can do something. Yeah. Thank you, Cal. I just wanna um, um, appreciate all the panelists for talking about this. And I wanna say political education is extraordinarily important. Um, in the black radical traditions, we say our ancestors wrote for themselves, right? And I would say that a number of people who have been on the inside have written for themselves as well. And we should pick that up and make sure we're reading it. And I also appreciate um, saying do this in groups. This is not an individual task, right? It is something that we should learn together and work together. So thank you for that. Susan? Yeah, I wanna, um uh, start to um, close up this portion of the panel uh, because we want to definitely appreciate the fact that um, uh, we have a really amazing audience in the room right now and online as well too. Uh, but those of you who are in the, in the room, uh, we want to get a chance to see if folks have any particular questions or comments that they want to be able to share with the panel and just keep the, the conversation going. Uh, but before we do that, um, I wanted to... Um, ask uh, those of you on the panel, if you could just say a little bit about um, how you think about the kind of organizing work that needs to happen in this day and age. 
And I particularly say that because um, uh, it's been amazing from my perspective to see the way in which the question of abolition has uh, really been brought to the fore over the last, um, let's say, like, you know, um, certainly the last decade and a half, but especially over the last seven years, uh, seven, eight years, there's been a much more robust conversation around questions of abolition. But one of the things that struck me is a lot of the ways in which that conversation has been, been moved forward has been mostly through mobilizations. And in more <coughs> limited ways, it's uh, been through organizing. And thinking about that in comparison to what we saw in um, the film uh, yesterday, the high level of organizing that existed behind bars, right? The way in which the NPRA had not only this board of directors, but also committee structure that helped to make sure, like the prison didn't just run by itself, right? Never the does. The prisoners <laughs> ran Walpole by having an incredibly sophisticated um, organizing structure, not such that they could just carry things out and committees would be held accountable for the work that needed to happen, but that even if somebody who was a board member <coughs> was uh, taken off the scene, was suddenly paroled or transferred or what have you, that they could have somebody who could step into that position. And I'm just curious in terms of um, what are some of the important lessons that you would want to share in terms of what organizing in the service of abolition should look like today? Um, and um, yeah, what, where do you see, where would you like to see that kind of work going um, uh, in the days ahead? Andrea, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's hard. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Um, we have a Free Her campaign to close the six women's prisons in the New England states right now. Why? Because New England has, states have the lowest incarceration populations of women in the country. It's geogra they're geographically, states that are geographically proximate to each other. We thought we could really build a loud drumbeat up. But um, we selected a distributed organizing campaign model to get that done. That's been one of the hardest things on the planet to do. We are very fortunate, though, and some of, uh, some of our staff are here, Kara and Austin and Joni's here, and Greg is in the background. Greg, Greg came out of prison and got re locked back up again for standing outside of Norfolk with us. But Greg walked, walked the Cromwell from the west to the east coast of the state with us to stop the building of a $50 million new women's prison for, at the time, well, it was 139 women. And right, still standing with us. It is so hard. It is boots on the ground. It is not done behind a computer screen. It is standing out in the frigid cold. It is raising public awareness because if you're a, if you're a, if you're a scholar of this work, you know. And we've worked with Paul Engler. We've worked with. Uh, 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 Carlos Saavedra, we've, we've been students of movements, not only in this country, but going back decades to understand what were those things that were able to advance movements. We know unequivocally that we can end the use of jails and prisons for women and girls in this country. We know it. We could do it today. We've practiced, we've tried, we've built through reimagining communities the pieces of what different looks like. We've done individual exit plans for prison, women in prison in Vermont that maybe might have 80 women in prison that they now just dropped an RFP that we are in the throes of a fight with, rinsing and repeating what we did in Massachusetts to stop a new multi, multi-million dollar women's prison in Vermont. And it is one of the hardest things that you will ever do is to be on the ground trying to raise public awareness in order to shift public opinion. And it, we, sometimes we just jump ahead, or Harvard or some elite place comes up with these grand things, we you know, that. institutes that are gonna do all this stuff. It, it, I mean, come on. You know, I'm in the street every single day, door knocking, canvassing, talking to people on the door stoop. Some of our, now I live in Roxbury, in the, in the most incarcerated corridor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Our family's been there for five generations. It's one of the hottest neighborhoods I have ever canvassed in, <laughs> ever. Because my elders in the community, they don't want to get robbed. Mm. They're afraid. And because that neighborhood also 
as a million dollar block, as Eric Cador laid out for us many years ago, mm -hmm. right here at Harvard University with yeah. the esteemed uh, Professor Ogletree, one of my mentors, who made sure two days after I came out of prison, I was sitting with David Harris in this school somewhere, listening to Eric Cador. These are the people that have laid out and given us the tools to understand the level of oppression and control that intentionally a system has done to our communities. Part of it, a lot of it is still, as we're the most incarcerated part of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in that corridor, coming up through Roxbury, up through Franklin Hill, Franklin Field, Blue Hill Avenue, we are the most under-resourced. And so we have to find ways to not only, and, and, and white folks got to come on. Come on now, we can't, and we couldn't have done what we did. White people from very elite neighborhoods came out and marched with us. They moved a jail prison moratorium bill in one session to the governor's desk. And we're not, we, we coming again. But we have to, you, you can't just say, close the prisons. Because people, the general public, I'll shut up after this. But one of the examples that we paid close attention to was the Marriage Equality Act. Now, now, you know, speak to the LGBTQ plus community and they will let you know there is a shit show it, it, all in that ecosystem as well. Like with the, all the rest of our ecosystems that we're all entangled with. But, but, but in one presidential, President Obama came into that office totally like not even sweating about saying no to marriage equality. In one administration, those folks got on the ground, same thing they are doing right now with a distributed organizing campaign like ours against anti-trans sentiment, to change that in this country. Now, we're fighting, as Professor Burnham reminds us, about the current politics of things. But it happened, and we know for sure that if we Take the time. It's time consuming. It has to be led by volunteers. We don't have the money at the National Council or EFTA. We are women who came out of prison who are trying to advance a different mindset in this country about the use of cages. And so uh, that's what I would say. For, 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 for folks that are actually doing it, that actually every single day, Kara is out on a street corner somewhere I hope your parents aren't watching. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, Austin is behind, you know, trying to tinker with strategy. And, you know, we're all like black, formerly incarcerated women. Nisi DeQuigan, whose daughter went to prison after she did because her mother was taken from her and died in prison of cancer in Louisiana, where the governor just stood up and gloated that he was going to build a beautiful new hospice in a multi, almost billion dollar new women's prison. And Nisi is home after 42 years, <clears throat> 42 years of incarceration, standing on the front lines in the streets with us every single day. Now you tell me, we have to take the time to understand how difficult this is and to give us the capacity to raise first public, public awareness because everybody we spoke to when we marched across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, even through Trump country, even at a Trump rally, were like, oh, hold on a minute. We even got some other stuff we could do with $50 million. We have to raise public awareness in order to begin to shift public opinion, and then that sweet point where the tip starts to happen. So that, that, that's what we're engaged and involved in, and it's the hardest work I've ever done in my life. No, appreciate that. It's incredibly hard work, but it's also oh my work God. that needs to happen. Beautiful work. And I, I want to I wanna ask um, um, the other panelists, Kazi, Margaret, Ed, um, what, are some of the, what are some of the lessons that you want to leave us with in terms of organizing, and particularly organizing in the service of abolition? Uh, what needs to happen? What should we be doing? Well, so let me just, I want to piggyback on uh, Andrea's comments, because she's described one for one critically important form of organizing, uh, which is person to person, uh, street to street by street, person by person, rally by rally. 
And uh, not all of us are going to end up doing that or, or for, our, for our entire careers uh, or our entire lives. But all of us need to do that at some point in your life. There's no, and I'm talking to the young folks here, not to, not to, not to you all. If you have gray hair, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the younger people here. At some point in your life, you may end up before a computer figuring out some policy that is going to advance our ultimate objective. You may end up there. You're at Harvard. You may very well end up there. But before you get there, you have to walk with somebody like Andrea. You have to understand what it means to organize. And I know some, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not talking, to, I hope I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm just talking to you. I know many of you are already deeply involved in organizing activity, and I'm talking to those of you who may not see the value and importance and critical, <laughs> critical education that is necessary that only comes from that uh, and then uh, informs whatever else you may be able, whatever else you may do with this utterly fabulous, very expensive education you're getting here at Harvard. <laughs> Kazi? Oh, man. Well, it's big. I think, um, you know, all that work has to go on. Uh, the work that, you know, people are dying today that can be saved, you know? So all that work has to be going on. And at the same time, I think, you know, uh, some of the lessons that came out of the last day or so, you know, Bobby was talking about how, you know, inside of Walpole, the guards was keeping black prisoners separated. They put two in this block, two in another block, two in another block, to, so that they couldn't get together to organize and how to defeat this thing. So the reason why, because they coming down on black people first, the hardest in this country. Always has been, always will be. When the bottom comes up, the rest will come up. So, you know, uh, it's just stopping us They've, the white supremacy has just been put there to stop us from getting together, collectively organizing to overthrow this thing, you know? And so it's, it's uh, Fred started the uh, Rainbow Coalition. A lot of people probably don't know that because it's now taken over by a different movement. But Fred Hampton started that. And he started going cross culture lines, cross lines, organizing, bringing people together. And inside the prison, that's what happened, right? Bobby was doing one half, you know, and the people, and, and um, Ralph was doing the other half. People coming together, understanding what their needs were, figuring out how to solve their problems themselves. We're going to have to do the same thing out here. You know, it's, it's, it's something that people have to do on all levels. We're going to have to separate and come together. Um, so right now we need reparations. Mm. You know, mm. autonomy and control of our own lives. Mm -hmm. On a move. Let me just, I want to pick up on what Kazi said, if I can, mm -hmm. on the reparations question. Uh, because, you know, we've talked about reparations for all kinds of things. My work is reparations for Jim Crow violence. Uh, but we also need to uh, both conceptualize, theorize, and then actualize reparations for folks who were locked up That's right. for 42, what did you say, 42 years? Right. 49. 50, 49 years? Mm -hmm. Those, uh, I disagree with, uh, I'm sorry, let me go off on this for just a second. I disagree with um, Sandy Darity. Sandy is a reparations theorist who takes the position that it's either H.R. 40, reparations for slavery, or nothing. There's no other form of reparations that we should be talking about or arguing about or fighting, fighting for. And I take the position that uh, we can con conceive of reparations programs for individuals whom we can identify, right. who have lost that's their right. lives, like Arnie King and That's others, right. That's right. who have lost their lives to this system and who are still with us mm -hmm. and whose losses are calculable, right. That's right. and that those people deserve reparations. Mm -hmm. They deserve repair. That's they right. deserve ma yeah. material reparations. Yeah, yeah. And I want to call it reparations 
because by doing that, to use a business term, we socialize the idea of reparations. So then it becomes more familiar to people when we start talking about reparations for more distant harms. Can I just say something about that, please? Of course. Margaret, um, thank you for raising that because as formerly incarcerated women, we've been going to the mat to raise money because we provide those reparations for women who are inside, long timers who have been inside and they will receive that money every month, $500 a month to help them live and survive inside of these cages. And then women who are home in the first year that they come home to help them to get on their feet, to get their children back, to try and find a place to live. And so we had to push that idea of reparations for people to understand. The level of economic disruption that prisons have caused black communities in this country is devastating. And if we don't recognize that, and also what people need when they come home, um, who have absolutely nothing, the prison opens the door and they kick you out. They don't care how long you've been in there. And there's nobody on the other end to receive you. And so you have to find ways to extend, expand that notion of what reparations is. So thank you, Margaret. Can I say one other thing? I say one other thing. I, 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 I must be remiss. Um, Jaleel Mutakim, who was a former political prisoner, wrote a book called um, We Are Our Own Liberators. That's right. And people should check that book out. Ger I, I work with an organization like this that I'm not co chair now. I used to be a co chair at Jericho. Um, and it fights for the release of political prisoners because a lot of people. Uh, in the Panther Party and other parties that they targeted um, a long time ago, like Sundiata, 87 years old, just got out of prison since 1972. Uh, you know, um, Matulu Shakur just was released with third sta stage bone cancer. Um, uh, Mumia is still locked up waiting for a new trial right now mm -hmm. today. You know, so... Um, you know, I just, I just wanted to shout them out. Yeah. And, you know, we need to, uh, oh, we, one other thing. We had a, a tribunal last year. Sure. And nine international judges found the United States guilty of crimes against humanity and black and brown indigenous people right here. And nobody hasn't been on the radio, hasn't mm -hmm. been on the TV, hasn't been on CNN or nothing. People don't even know. And when we were in South Africa, what, uh, they were found guilty. The United States government they didn't want to talk about Putin. Come on, man. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> that. Real. Appreciate that. We're, um, we want to make, I want to make sure that we give uh, Reverend Rodman just a chance to share um, as, we, as we move towards uh, taking uh, questions from the audience. Um, Reverend Rodman, if you have any um, Lessons that you would want to share with us in terms of thinking about organizing towards abolition? The fact that people have the energy to do this is very important. And maintaining that energy, that commitment, is the key to the whole thing. If we cannot keep hope alive, as Jesse used to say, then we are not going to be able to achieve its goals. We have to stick to it. We have to keep our energy and hope up. And most importantly, we have to believe that it can be done. And it is in the belief, in the faith, in the hope, in the hope that it can be done is the real answer to the problem. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask a question about organizing to my co-moderator, Tone, who is an <laughs> organizer. Um, if you could tell us, what, what, do you, what do you think are key aspects of what folks need to be doing in this day and age in terms of organizing towards abolition? Thank you. Um, first, I would be remiss if I didn't bring it back to Malcolm, who said, die like a man, right? Um, mm -hmm. To be inclusive, die like a person, right? Um, and what he meant by that is what, what's worth living for is also worth dying for. 
that may sound like really aggressive or it may sound like something antithetical to what you're trying to do. But I think that um, the way we should be looking at organizing is we deserve better. We deserve the right to life, right? Um, and so what are the things that we can do towards that? We've already talked about reading and learning and then also being in groups. I would say get involved. Um, you know, most people engage and work through the nonprofit industrial complex. That's not gonna work. It is proven not to work. You know, join radical organizations. And another way of thinking about radicals, things that are different from the norm. We want some, something different, so we have to engage in something different. Mm -hmm. Participate. Um, there's a notion of all politics is local. There are a number of organizations. I organize uh, locally and beyond, right? Um, within, for example, Black Lives Matter, there's a number of different factions. One is through the Black Freedom Front. That's the chapter that the Boston chapter is within. And in this, we are principled, uh, uh, Pan-Africanist organizers who engage in on-the-ground work. Uh, Andrea, 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 excuse me, already spoke about how difficult it is. We engage in canvassing, door knocking as well. It is very challenging, but more hands make for light work. Get involved. Also, do things that are near and dear that you believe in. If you're not familiar with something, learn about it. We talked about it. And then also um, associate with someone. Like, I'm sure she's reachable. She mentioned some folks in the audience. We are reachable. This work is not easy, and it will not get done by a few people, right? We, we're beyond the days of martyrdom. I would even argue the leadership structure is over. This whole Ma uh, Martin Luther King at the helm, you know, uh, Malcolm X, it's over. Everyone has to pick up this work and believe that it's, it is theirs. And um, also, the Black Alliance for Peace, right? So um, we look at, organ well, I would say, I look at organizing within black liberation movements in three buckets. Um, thought leadership, which the Black Alliance for Peace offers a lot of, on the ground organizing, I spoke of, I do this and a number of other people, as well as uh, lobbying or political activism, right? And so that could look like changing laws and such. Find your niche, find something that speaks to you, get involved in serious and important work and get it done. I mean, that's it, right. like a lot of people show, <laughs> a lot of people show up expecting to be inspired and then go home and do nothing. Get involved <laughs> and stay involved. Thank you. Right on. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna um, we're gonna open it up to the audience. And um, usually, when we do these things, I like to say, uh, um, please raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, this is Harvard. Folks are. Um, intelligent enough to tell the difference between a question and a comment or a statement <laughs> or a soliloquy or whatever it is. But we do also realize uh, that you all have been very patient. You all have been a very engaged audience and um, there's been a lot of information presented. And folks might just want to make a statement, offer a comment, or just a reaction to something that's been articulated. That is... Um, that is fair. So if you have a question or if you have a short comment, uh, please raise your hand. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by taking uh, four hands from the audience. We'll bring it back to the panel, and then we'll go back again. So we're going to do our best to make sure that we hear from as many people as we can in the audience and that we give uh, the panelists an opportunity to respond. If it's a general question, <coughs> please uh, let us know. If it's a question specifically to one of the panelists or a couple of the panelists, also please do let us know. And please, um, y'all in the room have been able to engage directly with folks or hear directly from folks on the panel. Um, people who are uh, watching via Zoom, they're not gonna be able to hear your wonderful, intelligent, brilliant, sophisticated <laughs> comment or question if you don't speak into the microphone. So please make sure that if you're offering a comment, you're doing so with the microphone relatively close to your face. So uh, can we, uh, any hands? And we'll uh, do our best to start taking them. Statement. Um, to the question of organizing, uh, I think one of the things that, that hasn't been said, when I spoke about uh, the Peace of Movement Committee earlier, one of the things that we did around organizing is that in order to enter, enter the organization, there had to be sponsorship. Today, the language is vetting people um, because everybody's not everybody. And so when we right. were about the business of organizing, we need to make sure that everybody that's involved is on our side and focused on the same agenda yeah. because there are 
unfortunately, there are saboteurs and, and, and like that. And so that's one of the things that we want to factor in. Like in this room. All right, any other, um, we want to take a couple more hands before we throw it back to the panel. I had a quick question. I know I was a moderator, so I don't want to occupy the time, but I have to ask this question. Uh, we talked a lot about what people should be doing, but there are a lot of people who have resources, people who are sitting in institutional positions of authority and power who absolutely need to move out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. I wanted to ask, pose this question to the panelists insofar as what should people who are justice minded and who are working within these institutions and seeing these struggles that have played out historically, how do we get these people out of the way? Ah. Uh, let's see, maybe if we have um, uh, <laughs> any other questions before we bring it back to the panel? Any other hands up? Just wondering if you could speak to, as a former public defender myself, how do we fix the harm, immediate harm, but also work on abolition? And do you see an overlap or a possibility there? Immediate. Immediate. Oh. Um, and then uh, any other questions or co short comments? On that uh, point, just want to note that it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. It's not either or or one thing. It is the capacity to see the whole picture, pick a spot where you can be helpful, and then go to work. Yeah, uh, let's get uh, one other comment and then we'll, uh, or comment, short comment slash question, and then we'll, um, we'll keep the, the panel going. Um, I'm thinking of uh, those people who are parents who are like 35 years old and younger who have children who are like teenagers and um, the whole need for the talk with their children, um, which they may not be acquainted with um, for many reasons, the dissolution of, of families and, you know, where the, there isn't all of the members of the family together, you know, uh, in touch with each other. So how, um, you know, would you all go about um, dealing with that. I'm, I'm thinking um, through like maybe social media to, uh, you know, give instances of things that happened in the community uh, where people got incarcerated, like some, you know, very stellar examples and, uh, you know, be able to transmit that to these young parents. Thank you. All right. Panel, a uh, couple different interesting questions and comments. How would you um, address handling uh, this question of the um, how parents talk to their kids about um, dealing with the criminal justice system or the police more directly? Right. Um, you can start there, or you can start it with some of the earlier questions. I'll leave it up. You want to me you to reiterate some of the questions? Yeah. Why don't you? I'll, I'll, unless you have an answer. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll address the second. The second question was, how do you deal from the from the uh, public defender, how do you def deal with immediate harms and uh, abolition? Are these two uh, two um, objectives uh, butting into each other? And you know, we face that. Obviously, the abolition movement has to face that um, question all the time. Um, but we need to think, and it's and it's it's an e it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward uh, answer here, which is that uh, abolition is not just about a, a fight and a struggle to abolish the thing that is um, embodying injustice. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking to uh, a point where the thing that we are facing today becomes unthinkable. Mm -hmm. So if you think about slavery today in 2023, the idea that this was a slaveocracy is unthinkable. We know that as a matter of history. But we, you can't imagine what slavery or Jim Crow was like. You just want to say, you want to shake your head and say, they did what? <laughs> and so we, we, we want, the abolition is about moving to the point 
where future generations will look back at these, at what Kasi has described and uh, Andrea have described as, as, uh, as uh, cages, mm -hmm. and they will say, they did what? That's what abolition is really all about. It's about denormalizing what today seems perfectly normal to most of us, right. which is you transgress, you go to jail, right? And so, you know, or, or, or it's about transforming our understanding of jail, while at the same time holding, we obviously have to hold in our minds what Bobby DeLayla said, which is people are going to do bad things to other people. That is the nature of human nature. That is human nature, right? Now, obviously, all kinds of other factors are involved, economic, social, racial factors. Everything else is involved, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, that will happen. And there will be other systems, right? There are other systems in other places that address that mm -hmm. piece of human nature. Just the way that we address it here is not really about, not just about people doing bad things to other people, but it's also about getting rid of an excess population. It's also <laughs> right. about late stage capitalism, if I can say that. It's about so many other things. And so, you know, as you do your work as a public defender and you see all these horrible things and you're like, no jail, or, or, or when Andrea was talking about the seniors in our, in our communities, you go talk to them and they'll say, you wanna get rid of what? You wanna get rid of the cops? Mm -hmm. Well, who's gonna protect me? Mm -hmm. Well, that's for us to use our imaginations and, and our work and our kind of understanding of what real justice could look like, to do but chew, walk gum, sit on two seats at the same time. Um, can I also, um, first off, I want to just applaud what you just offered. I hear this reoccurring theme, and I want to make sure people are very clear. Abolition is not just one definition, right? There are many definitions um, with abolition. And the type of abolition I understand is not just dismantling, but reimagining and creating. Right. So it's active. Um, and this actually really aligns with the question that the, the uh, person spoke about with justice-minded people and professionals. And I think the same answer can be applied in that we have to be brave and call it out, right? Like, we don't want to just have one person martyring. You have to stand up. We can't, we, the reimagining part is like, okay, this always continues to happen until you, and the you is looking in the mirror, d does something differently. So I just wanted to answer that. And then also, somebody spoke about children. Um, I want to say, because I was a person who, um, for millennials, I, I'm, I think that it's important to also understand that my parents had to talk with me, and not a lot of people know what that is. I don't know if that's a very black thing, because a lot of people don't encounter the police like we do, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for those who don't know, the talk is around you black, and you may get lit up by police because you're black. It doesn't matter if you're a nice person, or if you're kind, or if you're sweet and intelligent, you're still black, and that's what they see first and foremost. For those who just kind of didn't understand that, um, and then also with respect to this talk, I think that it's very challenging, right? Because some young kids cannot process why this is happening to them. And there are a lot of resources. We live in an information overload, right? There are a lot of resources online and connecting with different people to bring, um, bring young people, so for those who have young people in their lives, um, into other areas with where there's justice work happening um, that they can kind of experience at their level and talking with them being very honest um, you know, and kind of comforting them. I don't believe in telling kids lies, but I also believe in age appropriateness. But if anyone else wants yeah, to answer. Well, in terms of the children, I mean, uh, we work with groups like JYC. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these, these young people are in, in deep thought about mm. what needs to happen, how they are gonna make a contribution. Many of the children, um, you know, uh, directly affected, they're not, they're not unaware. Right. They know firsthand what's happening because they're, they're at the brunt of it. Their, their moms are in prison, they're separated from their fathers, our, our people are dying, the work is stressful, it's killing us on so many different levels. We have to figure out how to manage that, so they're losing parents, the struggle is hard for people, and so sometimes they go away from their families because 
it's all they know how to do to just figure out how to find their way. And so, um, you know, we try and do as much as we can to give the young people, we have one, let me, let me, let me just say this. We have one of the most amazing, most brilliant young leaders at Families for Justice and Healing in the National Council. It almost brings tears to my eyes. Our youth organizer, Brianna, is, has a 4.0, 4.0. This school should be running after her. <laughs> she is politicized. She is leading the youth movement in our organization. She is organizing other young people. She is directly affected. And there isn't a school in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, one of the largest places with higher institutes of learning, that has just said, here you go, Brianna. Let us figure out how to open the door for you. The most important contribution is going to come from young women like Brianna. She is amazing. She's graduating in May. And we're trying to figure out how do we pay her tuition? And we will. We will figure it out. We are housing her right now because she's houseless. This is the level of complete lack of understanding. There are, there, there's a brother who up in our humble, who oversees, um, oh shit, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> oversees um, um, Orphans for Life who took and showed me where, as a child, he tucked, when, when his house became too, too challenging to be in, would take his younger sibling and tuck him. This is a block from my house. Do you know how heartbreaking and painful that was to hear? In the dead of winter, for children in my neighborhood to leave their house in the middle of the night and they've, on their own, as children, found ways to tuck themselves under bus benches and between people's garbage cans and in the back of their back porches without us even knowing. This is happening right now in our neighborhoods with young people. And so it's real, this question she's asking about our children. But we call them our movement babies. And they've been out there all the way down to my grandbaby, Katori and Lola. They're out there. They know when they see a, a, a no women's prison sign, they know their position. Am I wrong? Those babies go and pick up their sign and take their position. They're two and four. <laughs> so, you know, th th we, have to, we have to nurture those young people that are brave enough and interested enough to take the lead. I Harvard needs to give Brianna a scholarship, a full damn ride. And we need to figure out all these brilliant minds in here, all you privileged folk that are gonna go on and run the world, bring Brianna <laughs> along with you, please. <laughs> Good for her. Can we add, produce more Brianna? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, does anyone want to take on any of the other questions that were asked around, like maybe what was justice-minded people should be doing, maybe at the workplace? Um, I also want to say, engaging in some of this work uh, creates political prisoners, right? Kazi mentioned that before. Um, political prisoners exist because they are effective. Think about it. Um, and so um, uh, they are inside and they're being erased. If, um, there are a number of um, individuals that people are supporting. And if, Kazi, if you want to elaborate on any of that, the work, like how people can get involved, um, please feel free. Well, they could, you know, the spirit of Mandela, like I was saying earlier, um, we had a, a tribunal last year where nine international judges found the United States guilty, five categories, um, crimes against humanity. And people doing this work could go on the site of uh, Spirit of Mandela and see where they might can fit in mm -hmm. because there was five categories that they were found guilty of. And if you're doing work around prison, uh, the uh, school to prison pipeline, if you're doing work around medical, if you're doing work around women's issues, they, you know, you can go on there. And one of the things that came out of that uh, tribunal was people trying to build, uh, through the spirit of Mandela, they're trying to build uh, a people's senate. 
And, you know, um, I don't know what that would look like, <laughs> but, you know, it's progressive work. Yes, sir. Keith. Just uh, hold for a sec, because we want to make sure the microphone. And this is actually a good time for us to take another round of questions. So after Keith goes, if anyone else wants to ask a question. Um, and comment. this is a comment, and folks could respond to it if they want. But when you look at the film last night, we talk about reparations, repair, to make whole. Um, and the whole slavery, prison of pipeline. There's this thing called trauma generational, individual, okay. and community. And that trauma reflects on everything that happens. Yes. And part of that abolition yes. is to address that trauma. Yes. And that's more than money or whatever. There's a whole thing that folks have to deal with when you have to get to talk. And that's trauma to, the, to that next generation that's passed down, that's passed down, that's passed down. Just wanted to mention that. And, and you know, and Keith on that trauma is is something that um, I saw come when I came out. And I saw, you know, uh, people having more compassion for animals mm -hmm. than they did people. Mm -hmm. You know, there Good was point. an earthquake in California and the animals, the cats and dogs were dislodged from their houses for a couple of weeks. They were on the news talking about when you people come down and pick up your animals from the shelters, uh, give them some time to reacclimate, just put, put the food down and move out the way and let them find their way to it because they've been in an institution for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, people been in prison for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and come out kicked out with nothing, man and you know, on an unsuspecting public. Thank you for those comments. Um, we wanna collect some more um, questions before we um, begin to answer just in the interest of time. So I um, want to look at it from the economics point of view. Um, the man I, I started, learned so much from Harold Adams, always said that the underlying issue is economics and that the system, basically, all the prisons produce profits for you know industry, and this is true <clears throat> both locally and nationally. And um, and w what he suggested was that any movement to change this must keep that in mind. In other words, that it wasn't sufficient to see um, opposition from the people running the system but to see that there's an underlying economic reason why politicians are also involved in the system. And, um, and he was also suggesting that um, in terms of action, that we should be thinking in terms of an economic action, something that undermined the, the profit system. Um, at one point we were campaigning for, for on phones because the... <coughs> Basically, the, the system in Massachusetts at that point, and I'm not sure if it's still the same, which is that one department of the Massachusetts government would set the rates, um, which, and the rates always profited for the other department of the Massachusetts government. In other words, the Department of Telecommunication and Cable <clears throat> set the rates, and the Department of uh, the, the, the prison system benefited from these kickbacks from the telephone companies. Um, so therefore we set about trying to have public hearings to change that on the phone system. Um, so, on the, so ongoingly, obviously, we've had this fight about trying to have free phones. We've had the fight about um, parole and probation fees being abolished. So I'm wondering, in a kind of sense, we've kind of made some progress on those issues what is a new economic edge that we can use <clears throat> to kind of undermine that economic system? Right, so panelists take note of that, and we want to just see if there's any other questions before we have folks come back. You all are being very... Well, I, I can right, answer okay. that question real quick. 
um, while we're waiting, in case anybody has any questions. I know you guys have been here for a long time, and it's getting late. Um, but um, one of the things, so we, we're, we're in that slugfest for no-cost calls, and thank you to everybody, including yourself, obviously, who has uh, made a contribution to that no-cost calls campaign that we've been waging for years now. Um, and, you know, we made 12 cents an hour when I was in prison, and we were all mothers. And so I was fortunate that my children were, were with my husband, um, God bless him, and my parents. But, um, you know, most of the women, they, their children were, if they even knew where they were, because the system had taken many of them, they were in households spread out. When you say you made 12 cents an hour, what do you mean? You made 12 cents an hour. <clears throat> I was paid 12 cents an hour. For? For working. Yeah, okay. For working in the prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything from cleaning toilets to, I had the privilege, when you talk about women running the prison, women ran the prison at, at Danbury. So I had the privilege eventually, after really shitty jobs, of the women coming to me and, and, and telling me, you're gonna come in and you're gonna teach. So the last year that I was there, I had the privilege of teaching in the prison and it, it changed my life. And, but um, the, the, one of the things that we've learned from as we are fully engaged, a lot of these people that you see back there, fully engaged in these economic campaigns, we, we decided through reimagining communities that we had, we, the, these things aren't gonna change fast enough for us. We have to figure out a way to gut our sisters out of this system, but also to develop economic opportunity. And so a, a, a large piece of the reimagining communities work we do are cooperative businesses. We just bought our building in Nubian Square. We got it. Developers have bought up every single building in my beloved Nubian Square formerly Dudley, down Dudley, we used to call it, except us. And we, we're, we call it the People's Building. The formerly, currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women raised that money and bought that building. Uh -huh. And so in the front of that building, the very first, we're, we're developing with Harold Adams, CDL course, Harold um, um, and a brother named Wayne who was locked down in Angola for years and came to Massachusetts is helping to lead the CDL program. We just partnered with Pro EMS in Cambridge, where formerly incarcerated women who are actively engaged in organizing in our reimagining communities can go to Pro EMS and we incur the cost to cover their tuition with Pro EMS so that they can become EMTs. So that we can not only put them on ambulances, but we can create that alternative crisis response team led by the women who are, who are trained, those kind of businesses. And in addition to that, our first cooperative that will sustain, because as nonprofits, we have to figure out, we cannot sit around and just, we, are, we had a 34-year-old billionaire who funded us for a couple of years and just decided one year, I'm gonna go fund uh, salamanders in El Salvador, literally. literally. Would sit at the table with me and have lunch for a couple of years and commit to ending incarceration of women and girls with us with her 34 year old billion dollars. <laughs> and literally decided without even communicating with us anymore, nope, I'm gonna not do that anymore. So we, we learned from that. I mean, we knew it anyway. But you ha we have to begin to develop cooperative businesses where one person isn't leaving and taking the bag. Everybody gets to get in and to share the resources and to, and to keep the dollar circulating in our neighborhoods. And that first place that we're working with David Lee of Stellan Lee, black architect, to help us to transform 100 up Warren Street. And, and the first co-op business that's going in there is the first floor, it's called Scoop of Justice. So every time you come in and you buy an ice cream cone from us, you're gonna see here, receive a napkin with information, how you can get involved, um, and this. Kazi talked about it. People, all the work, people don't know. So we decided, not completely outside of our general operating budget that we get from being a nonprofit, a 501c3 and a c4, outside of that completely, not bound by philanthropy, which is a beast, when you look at the history. 
we have the Free Her Think Tank. The Free Her Think Tank supports the work to end incarceration of women and girls. Kara is right there. Kara has all this information. Please get a QR code from Kara. She also has t-shirts that Harvard told us we couldn't sell. The, this is an old crappy t-shirt, um, but we have much nicer t-shirts that say free her. And our think tank, bec why? Because we have to be able to amplify the work that we're doing and to shift public opinion, and we need the infrastructure of a think tank to do that, to do that. And so we have a beautiful place that my parents donated to me with the instructions from my father, do not give that place to the nonprofit industrial complex. <laughs> On Martha's Vineyard, a beloved place for my family, to use as the think tank. And guess what? We're, we're, we're making it so that the sisters can come down, which they already do. My parents, the, the door isn't even locked right now. There's probably sisters in there thinking and strategizing right now. But to build up the think tank in that space so that sisters can come and be in community and work on their projects and figure out how to get us out of these places. But please, we are selling 40,000 t-shirts. No shit. <laughs> that is a lot of making t-shirts. <laughs> We're dizzy from making t-shirts. And Kara can show you one of the t-shirts. You can go online. We're asking you to go online. I don't care if you don't wear t-shirts. Give it to somebody. <laughs> buy a shirt or pretend to buy a shirt. Just make the donation of the cost of the shirt. I think they even added a mug onto there. And, and help us to build this think tank not using nonprofit industrial complex dollars. All right. Right on. Right on. So uh, we're getting close to time. Um, and we, again, appreciate everyone in the audience for your, uh, your patience. Um, your contributions, and um, really and fundamentally in the spirit of this panel, the work that you're going to continue to do as you leave uh, from here. Uh, some of that might be in the form of buying a t-shirt or pretending to buy a t-shirt um, <laughs> and making a donation. Some of that, some of that might be in the form of um, joining some of the folks on this panel when they do door knocking or other forms of organizing. Um, and some of that might be spreading the word from what you heard here not just during this panel, but uh, the day and a half that um, uh, was involved in focusing not just on the history of the 1973 Walpole takeover, but also the legacies that continue to resonate today. Buy Margaret's book. Wait, wait, and wait. Thank Thomas Dichter. Hey, Tom, stand up, baby. Okay. Right. And Jamie, and yeah. Jamie. So, so Margaret's shouting out uh, uh, Thomas, uh, myself, and Jamie Bissonette, whose book uh, some of you hopefully got a free copy of. Uh, but um, uh, there was a lot of work that was put in uh, by us and by other people to really make this possible. Uh, what we want to transition to is a reception uh, that's taking place. Oh, uh, um, <laughs> It's taking place uh, that gives folks an opportunity to have more of a conversation. Some of y'all might have had questions or comments and you want to raise them because you're going to be on Zoom and you don't want to be held liable for what you say or um, <laughs> because you want to talk in a more one-on-one -on -one setting. Maybe, though, to close out, if we could just have the panelists share any closing thoughts um, uh, to kind of get us out of here. Do you, do you want to do that? Oh, yeah, sure. No. Oh, no. I think we okay. did that already. Right, so let's, I'll we, say something. I'll say something, man. Because uh, I was quick, trying to, I was quick, trying to say it before. Quick. Yeah. But, but one of the ways that people was asking how to, you know, break down the fear in the community of prisoners and people coming out and uh, whatnot, um, you know, there's a thing people start doing in other communities. It's curb fest, where you can block off the street yes. and put some music out and have some food out and invite your neighbors out uh, and break down conversation with them. All righty then. That's it. Right. So. Curvefest.com. It's a form of buy popular Mar education. Buy Margaret's book. Yes. We need to, <laughs> you need to buy Margaret's book because it's part of our political education. So if you haven't, yeah. do that, please. And DOC, let us in the prison. <laughs> you guys, you <laughs> guys will not that. let us in the, pr in the women's prison. Like we've been to the top, down to the bottom. We will. We're we're coming in for good. 
but we have got to break, we're, we're gonna get the walls broken down one way or another, but let us in the prison. So, so, we want to so, say peace to the uh, those are that are on the inside. Thank you so much for everybody who attended this symposium. Thank you to Tucson and all the people who went into um, developing this program. We appreciate you and all those who are hearing us, whether now or through a later Zoom. We appreciate you. We look forward to connecting with you and building a new justice-minded community together. Welcome, thank welcome you. One final. Oh, welcome home to all so many of the brothers that I see here. Thank you, everyone, and please go in peace.